Well, good morning, Milford Bible Church. It is a joy to be here. Thank you for the first part of this service. It is such a joy to hear a congregation that sings. I, you probably don't get around to, to many churches, but in so many churches that we have been in, the congregation does not sing. They stand and they listen. And what a joy it is to hear voices singing praises to God. So I want to thank you for that. You know, we have, I, I'm going to take a special opportunity right now and do something I have never done in a sermon. And that is, I'm going to ask that the congregation reads the entire book of what we're going to study. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of 3rd John. Now, before you get too worried about this, it's only 15 verses long. <laughs> and I've never preached from the third book of John. So we've, I've never had this opportunity, so I'm going to take it. Turn to 3rd John, if you, if you would, in your pew Bibles. It's on page 1,214. It is the third to the last book of the Bible. So we have Revelation, Jude, and then 3rd John, and then 2nd John, 1st John, 2nd and 1st Peter. Uh, and maybe some of your kids could tell me the order of the books of the Bible backwards sometime. That would be fun too. Uh, so turn there, and while you're turning there, I just want to give you an idea of what you're going to be reading. There are four people in this book. One is the author, John, the uh, apostle of Jesus Christ, but he's writing as an elder from the church of Ephesus in this book. The second one is Gaius. Gaius is a man. We have no idea what church he was at. We just know two people in this church. He, Gaius, and Diotrephes which he's mentioned later on. He's one of the leaders of the church. And then the fourth, fourth person is Demetrius. Demetrius was a missionary, one who was sent out for the sake of the gospel. So those are the four characters we'll be reading about. The book itself is a letter to encourage the church, which we don't even know the name of, to support Demetrius, the missionary. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask that you stand in respect of God's word, and let's read together these 15 verses. Starting in verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius, 
has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends. Yes, and every one of them. Thank you, and please be seated. It's an interesting book, isn't it? One story to follow in this book. Many of the books, there, there's different doctrines and different stories and, and everything, but this one is, is really rare in that it is one line, one plot, everything together in these 15 verses. We're going to look at all 15 verses uh, very quickly, but really focus in on the part that Milford Bible Church plays in this plot, and that's in verses 7, 8, 8. So let's get started in this. You, you see the, the greeting. Uh, it's a normal greeting for the apostles to, to encourage them. But I just want to point out one part of this, uh, and, and that is verse 3. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. You know, we have been a part of Milford Bible Church now for 20 years. Um, I know the Marats have been for how many years? Say that again. Did you hear that on that side of the room? 47 years. Uh, that they have been a part of the family of Milford, Milford Bible Church. And it is such a blessing to come here and see people walking with the Lord. And those that, that we've had the privilege of watching grow up, literally here, and see them walking with the Lord, it is a great joy to come back and visit you with, with Milford Bible Church. So I wanted to, to point that out to you because part of the, the challenge that missionaries often have is uh, a supporting church will be gung-ho and then after 47 years, some of those churches have turned away. But you haven't. And I want to, to commend you as a church for your faithfulness. And that leads us into verse 5. Let's look at verse 5. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are. You know, you don't know who you're getting when you, you take on a missionary. When we came here, we, we had the privilege of being very good friends, and, and our testimony was um, backed up, I guess you would say, by, uh, by Rod and Kathy Ryle. Uh, I grew up with Rod, and uh, it, it, you guys took him on, and that was a stretch of faith on your part. But, uh, but we came in with, with their testimony. So it was a faithful act for you. Do you know what faith is? You know, every time you take a step walking, you're stepping out on faith. Because in order to walk, you have to throw your body off balance. You can't walk, you can't run without being off balance. So the moment that you put your, your balance going forward, you take a step. And the faith comes in when your, your leg holds you up. Now, I know some of you are, are older now, and you worry about that step. You're not sure if that leg is going to hold you up or not. That faith is what moves a person forward. When you're more off balance, you run. But it's that faith that gets that momentum going that causes you to run. 
So here, when the Apostle John says to Gaius, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do. You took a step of faith to support, what is it, 24 missionaries right now? I lost count in, in the flags. I get very emotional when I see those flags coming down. Uh, but I think it was 24. You take a step of faith. It is a faithful thing that you do when you support missionaries. And the whole purpose of that is to move us, not the missionaries only, but us, including you, forward. It is a faithful thing. We're see, we'll see that a little bit more in detail in a couple of seconds. Okay, but realize you are, you are being acknowledged today for your act of faith that is literally worldwide. Your testimony is being shared on almost all the continents. I didn't hear Australia mentioned, and I don't think you have anybody in Antarctica yet. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. But your testimony is on the continents of a faithful body of believers that is moving forward. Let's keep going here. Verse 6, who testified to your love before the church. And then John's challenge to the, the congregation, to Gaius. You will do well to send them on the way in their journey. Look at this next phrase, because I will be very honest with you. I do not know what this means. Send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. I don't know what that means. What I do know is that the bar is pretty high. How do you send a person on a journey in a manner worthy of God? How does God send someone out on a journey? How is, how is he pushing people out on a journey? My God will supply all of your needs is what God's word says. He will be faithful to supply you with everything that you need. Even when we are faithless, he is faithful. So I, I picture this. God supplies all of our needs. Now that's, that's not just finances. And please do not pin down finances yet. We'll talk about that in a second. But, but it's a lot more than finances. You know, when your missionaries leave from here and go to a foreign land, a different culture, they have so many emotional needs at that point. Uh, when they go out as a single, Cheryl and I went out as singles. You all are part of that story, and I just thank you for it. But we went out singles, which means as a single person, a missionary leaving goes out without their best friend. There's loneliness on the field. There's loneliness as singles. There's loneliness as couples. And this verse says, my God will supply all of your needs. How does God supply the need of being in a group when you're by yourself? Think about that. How does God supply that need for, for being wanted? How does God supply that need for, for feeling like you're, you're being used by him when you can't even speak the language? How does God supply the, the need of, of 
family. You know, when God said to, to Abraham in, in Genesis, I want you to go out, I want you to leave your family, I want you to leave your country and go to the place that I will show you. He didn't even know where he was going. But he said he would, you would be leaving your family. How does God supply that need of wanting to care for your family, your mom and dad, your brothers and sisters, your nephews and nieces? How does God supply that need? In a manner worthy of God. Let's keep going. I think we'll find the answer. For, verse 7. For they have gone out for the sake of the name. The sake of the name. What a powerful phrase. Your missionaries have left their family, their country, their closeness of 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 relationships, their friends, their culture, for the sake of the name. You all just sang about that. The sake of the name, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the name that is above all other names that, that Paul said, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and earth. Every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. The question is, will they be bowing in judgment or will they be bowing to their God and Savior? And that is the sake of the name. So that all will know. Pastor quoted Matthew 28, 19 a second ago. Go make disciples of all nations. That word in the Greek in the nations is ethnos. It means all people groups. That's important to you. How many people groups do you have rep represented in the tri-state area here? I would beg to say you probably have most of the world represented in the tri-state area. People group for the sake of the name so that when that name is mentioned and those knees bow, they will be bowing in worship and adoration to their Lord and God and not bowing in judgment because they've already been condemned. People who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. I'm working with a, a man now, that, uh, a man and his wife who are currently uh, in a restricted ac access country. 93 million people in this people group. 93 million. They know of two house churches for 93 million people. For the sake of the name, they leave all that they have here, country, family, friends, culture, and go to a place where nobody knows the name of Jesus. Nobody knows what Christ has done for them. Nobody knows the salvation that is available to them. Nobody knows the water that once you drink it, you thirst no more. Nobody knows. It's not that they've rejected it. It's that they don't know. For the sake of the name, missionaries go out so that the world will have a chance to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what missionaries do. Now, we get to the, the good part of the, the book. For, uh, seven, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. 
Therefore, we ought to support people like these. Let's stop right there. That word support in the Greek is a fascinating word. It's made up of two different words. One is from under, and the other is to raise up. So a support is one that gets under and lifts them up. For, for that support, it is Milford Bible Church getting underneath of your missionaries and reaching up, meeting those needs in a manner that is worthy of God. And then here comes the fun part for you guys. The rest of that verse, verse 8, says, Therefore, we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Fellow workers, grouped, partners, fellow helpers. There's other ways it's translated in, in different versions of the Bible but that you are united. That's what the meaning of that word is. It uses a Greek prefix that says united. You're united with your missionaries. So how is it that you unite with the missionaries to be fellow workers? Let me give you four things. Two of these you're probably very aware of. I'm sure you're very aware of being from Milford Bible Church. The first part is prayer. Helen Ferris does a great job of communicating with us each month and putting out a prayer con calendar for you guys. That is an important part. Uh, Paul, in the book of Colossians, asked the, the church at Colossae to pray for open doors for us. You have no idea of the effect that prayer has for your missionaries. I have a good friend. He served with us in, in Mexico for a number of years. He left uh, is now a, a pastor of a Hispanic church in Indiana. How many of you guys have highs and lows in, in your life? Anybody here have highs and lows? Well, welcome to the club, because we do too. We have highs and lows. And my friend Pete, after he left Mexico, he would call every once in a while. But I noticed a pattern that every time I was hitting one of those low spots, Pete would call to encourage, to raise up. It got to be a joke between Cheryl and I. I you know, I'm having a tough time and Cheryl says, it's about time for Pete to call. The computer rang. Hi, Pete. Pete is walking so in touch with God that when God says, hey, you haven't talked to Neil for a while. Why don't you give him a call? Pete picks up the phone and calls. Those calls take us through some of the most dark valleys that we have experienced. And they come out of nowhere. So your prayers for us are those that carry us through. First point of support, pray. Pray consistently. Second is the finances. We cannot be in where the places that we are without financial support. And I'm going to share with you this. This is a, a concept that is called the compound effect. But I want you to see how easy it is to support missionaries. 
if everyone in this room were to commit, commit to give a dollar every day, put it in a jar, what do we have here today? Someone give me an estimate. How many people here? 300? 300? Okay. If 300 people were to commit to give $1 a day for an entire year and do that, let's make it for three years, okay? For three years. Do you know how much money would be raised? $300,000. It's the compound fact. You do a little consistently for a long period of time, and the effect is something great. If 300 people were to give $1 a day for missionaries with 24 missionaries that, that you're supporting, you would be able to increase the support for missionaries by about, for each one, by about $6,000 per year. Now you say a dollar a day is pretty much. Well, cut it in half, do 50 cents. Uh, then you're increasing $3,000 a year. You see, my point is, it's not difficult. It doesn't take a whole lot when there's many people. So, my challenge to you is to consider this. What is important is the consistency. That consistently, given over time, will do great things around the world. The other advantage of being consistent in that is if every day you save 50 cents and you prayed as you're saving that 50 cents, you would see some incredible things happening around the world. Third thing, don't forget us. Please don't forget your missionaries. I will tell you, having worked with missionaries, coached missionaries, been with missionaries on the field, most missionaries feel forgotten by their home churches. It's, it's that thing of being out of sight, out of mind. We, we don't think badly of them for that. But please don't forget your missionaries. You know, in today's world, it is so easy to contact your missionaries it really is. We had a Skype number in, in Mexico that people in Delaware could dial seven digits on their phone and, and talk to us. Uh, nobody did. You know, you all could dial 10 numbers. You all can send emails. Whenever it is, just like Pete, whenever it is that God brings one of us to your mind, drop us an email. Let us know that you're there. And let me take you to the fourth one. And that is, take care of our parents. Take care of the families that we leave behind. You know, in today's world, when a missionary goes out, and many missionaries are going into very, very, very dangerous areas, part of our training is what to do if we're kidnapped. What to do if a spouse is, is murdered on the field, martyred on the field. That's the training that we have to receive these days. But one of the hardest things that missionaries have to do is to have that conversation with mom and dad. On average, over the last 10 decades, there are 90,000 martyrs for Jesus Christ.
That's one every six minutes. One every six minutes, somebody says, no, Jesus Christ is so important to me. I will not renounce his name. 900,000 over the last 10 years have died for Christ. Last week, we were at a Missio Nexus conference, and they showed a slide presentation of the missionaries from the groups that were at the conference. The almost 100 missionaries that have been martyred over the last 70 years, with the last one being John Chow just last year. It is a reality for them, but it's also a reality for their parents. So don't forget the parents. Take care of mom and dad for your missionaries, please. It's one of the greatest things that you can do for us. So four things for that support, prayer, finances, don't forget us, don't forget our parents. And you are fellow workers if you do these things. Now, the good news about being a fellow worker for Jesus Christ is that when we're in Mexico, you're there with us too. And that's how God sees it. If you're with Kenya, you're in Kenya. If you're in the tri-state region, you're in the tri-state region. All of that, according to two places in Scripture both in in Colossians 2.8 and in Philippians 4, it comes out to that all is counted to your account. So it is as if you are with us and you are with us in those good times, you are with us in those difficult times. It is all counted to your account. Your missionaries may be the point people But just like a a football team, you know, everybody talks about the quarterback, but there's a lineman that you probably don't know the name of, and he is the one that's protecting those quarterbacks. So our names are used up here, but just like those last night that were holding up that yarn, you are as important as any of your missionaries are. And when, when Jesus gave us the great commission of go and, and make disciples, realize that is all of our responsibilities. Now, let's really quickly finish this up in John 3. Wow. In verse 9, he talks about Diotrephes. Diotrephes was a, a man who who loved to get the credit and be up front and, you know, he he wasn't really interested in the gospel. He was interested in himself. But he was keeping others from supporting those missionaries that were coming through. And I want you to look at this. This is one of those black and white areas, guys. Um, Verse 11, beloved, Do not imitate evil, but imitate good. The evil is not supporting the missionaries in this context. The good is supporting missionaries. Just don't imitate the evil. Support the good. Do what is right in a manner worthy of God. Be aware that that prayer, that support, financial support, those uh, digital phone calls or, or emails or whatever, that taking care of our parents is all part of the good here that God asks you as Milford Bible Church to do. Now, I can tell you 
from experience in other churches that Milford Bible Church is a very rare church in your support. And we thank you for that. But I do want to challenge you in it to not be complacent, to think what is it that would be worthy of God in your support for your missionaries. Whether it be in prayer, whether it be in finances, whether it be in, in uh, communications with us, not forgetting us or supporting our parents. What is it that would raise what you all do well to the level of worthy of God? That's a question that you all have to answer. But it's one that your missions committee needs to, to delve, uh, wrestle with and, and the leaders of the church need to wrestle with this. What is worthy of God for those that go out for the sake of the name? And then John closes out. Uh, verse 13 doesn't apply because I get to be here. I don't have to write a letter. Uh, I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon. And we get to talk to you face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends. Every one of them. Thank you for being our friends. And I greet you face to face as friends. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this entire book. Lord, it is a challenge to us. It is a challenge to first of all be the missionaries that, that go out for the sake of the gospel. And it's a challenge for the congregation to support those missionaries in a way that's worthy of you. Father, give us as missionaries grace and mercy and open doors. And Father, give this congregation as our fellow workers, those who are gaining in their accounts the wisdom and the knowledge to know how best to support missionaries that are all over the world. And Lord, lastly, for those that are in areas where they will suffer for even speaking the name of Jesus, for those who, even since I've been speaking this morning, those four or five who have died. For the sake of the name, Father, comfort the families that are now grieving and let them know that it was worth it. And Father, we pray these things, giving glory to you, our Lord, and Savior. In Jesus' name, that precious name, we pray. Amen.